and I am officially on the job market, and it's very exciting. For your convenience, I've broken it down into three parts. Professional resume, athletic and special skills resume, and Dwight Schrute trivia. I am ready to face any challenges that might be foolish enough to face me. There's nothing on my horizon except everything. Everything is on my horizon. I got this job to make some money while I continue my employment search. And, uh, that's fine for the time being. Oops. Breaks over. Good morning. Good morning. I trust you had a good weekend. Welcome to chapel. Jordan McCain is a junior pastoral ministries major, stands with me here, and I've invited him to do an internship with me this semester. So if you don't mind, Jordan is going to be leading chapel. Good morning. Let's look at the events we have on campus. We have a blood drive tomorrow. We're going to learn more about that. Career week is this week, and there are events today, tomorrow, through the rest of the week. So talk to John Beck. He works really hard on that. Retro night with Richard Simmons, which you saw in the video. Bring your short shorts it's tonight at 8 p.m. Women's basketball game on Wednesday against St. Francis at 7. Connect prayer event on Thursday. with Lip sync if you want to perform. Show up. Do your best lip sync impersonation. If you have any writing, submit it to the Oak Tree Review for February 19th. And then if you want to do Talents for Christ, we're almost out of spots. That's May 5th and May 7th. You know, sign up, tell Ron about it. Buy a crush for Puerto Rico missions. That's a big deal. We need a lot of money for that. I'm going on that trip, so I'm invested in that. They want you guides, so that's next Monday. Applications are available. And then this beautiful picture, the Guatemala team has sent to mock us in their beautiful weather. And now we have Tanil, who's going to make an announcement about the blood drive. Hello, everyone. Tomorrow is our next blood drive, which I'm sure you're all really excited about. It will be going on, thank you, from 11 to 6 tomorrow, and it'll be right here in the church gym. So we would love for you all to come. If you guys have any questions, if you want an across cultural, please see myself or Leanne Porter. We will be happy to help you. Although we want you to know, Red Cross has labeled this drive urgent because of the um, really awful weather. A lot of cancellations has been happening with surgeries and just the drives themselves. So surgeries have been postponed and we just need those blood platelets so we would love to have you. Spring Arbor is known for the biggest drives, one of the biggest drives in the region. So we want to keep that name. So please come see us. We'll be signing up appointments. Walk-ins are available. Okay, thanks guys. I'd like to invite our speaker to come on up. Jason Rates has been in ministry for 18 years, and uh, he's been a youth pastor, a church planner, and he speaks all around the country. So as he comes up, he comes up here, would everybody please stand for prayer and for worship? And if the prayer guys would come on up, we're going to pray for this dude. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful winter day that we can just come together and praise you with no restrictions. Lord, that there's just so much that you want to do here in the hearts and lives of students that you are living and you are active in this place. And Lord, I thank you for Jason, for the encouragement that he will be to us. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would just be like good soil as he speaks your word and as it grows within us. Lord, I pray that we would just be able to worship you with the desire that you seek for with, from us. Lord, I just pray that this service would go as you will. And it's in your mighty and holy name I pray. Amen.
So the year was uh, 1988, maybe, 88, 89, somewhere back then. I'm a freshman in high school at Lutheran High Westland in Westland, Michigan. Well, thanks very much. Go, go us. I'm walking through the hallways now uh, in 1988 or 89. I don't remember which year. High school was a bunch of years for me, so whichever year it was, I was a bit on the shorter side. So uh, I was four foot three. So it wasn't until I hit the big old age of 16 till I hit the five foot barrier. <laughs> Some of you are like laughing for me, like you poor guy. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. It was so great. I remember I'd go to my locker and the girl next to me was like 700 feet tall. I mean, I still remember her name. Her name was Sarah. And I would like yell up to her, Sarah! I couldn't reach my lunch because it was on the top shelf. So I had to throw it up there and she would have to get it for me. And I would hear like this big voice from heaven, yes, little boy. She would like lower my lunch down to me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm walking through the hallways, it's crowded as can be. All of you tall people messing with the hallways. There's this kid in my school. Not going to give you his real name, Ron, but I, you know, I won't give you the rest of it, but not that I've Facebook stalked him, but isn't it great though in 2014, like we can officially use the word stalk in an okay sentence, like <laughs> I Facebook stalked you, oh, cool, <laughs> cool, but if you don't use Facebook, you're just, you're just out to dry like I stalked you, <laughs> oh. That's awesome, creepo. Anyways, there's this kid, Ron, awesome kid, captain of our basketball team. Again, he was like six foot nine or however tall he was, wingspan of a jet. I mean, he this kid was huge. Only kid in our school had a full mustache, big old like giant, awesome mustache. Not like, you know, eighth grade guys. You remember guys when we were eighth grade and we'd get like the three mustache hairs? And we'd be like, check these out, ladies. Like, oh yeah. Like, no, this is like a, like a chipmunk, like just on his. <laughs> and he always spelt, uh, smelled like Old Spice. I mean, this guy was just amazing. Had this big, like, like chihuahua of chest hair that popped out. <laughs> I swear he was like 24. But anyways, he's walking through the hallway. And I could just sense he was coming because you could smell the Old Spice. But then you could just always sense evil when it was around you. No offense to this guy. But he just loved to give me a hard time. Like, that was his gift in life. Give Jason a hard time. And I remember walking through the hallway, and I'm ducking and weaving. I'm trying to get to class. It's the second week of school. I barely know where I'm going. And I had begged my parents for something on the school supply list. They said, Mom and Dad, Mom and Dad, you have to get this for me. You have to get this for me. And it was called a trapper keeper. Now, back in those days, see, some of you, you're like, a trapper keeper, what is that? Here's what a trapper keeper was. Like the greatest invention known to man. Because a trapper keeper is a three-ring binder with a little folder with Velcro. <laughs> like NASA invented Velcro. Like the greatest substance ever. And you could, get you could get trapper keepers with like kitties on them. You could get trapper keepers with like Millennium Falcons on them. 
It was awesome. And my parents did not get me the Trapper Keeper. And I'm walking through the hallway. I have my three-ring binder. My freshman year English teacher, her name was Mrs. Stressman. No joke, Mrs. Stressman. Now, for me, I'm going to just be as straight up as honest as I can with you. I'm a simple guy. Not very SMRT up in the upstairs category. <laughs> I waited till the night before to get my, my homework assignment done. Back in those days, we didn't have this thing called computers in our household. Crazy concept. Crazy. So I had to handwrite this whole paper. And I didn't staple it because I was poor and we didn't have staples. <laughs> I was like, Mama, just buy my staples. Who do you think we are? We can't afford staples. So anyways, I'm, I'm going to class, and I got my binder, and I'm walking through the hallway. I just sense evil coming. I can see the classroom. Ron comes up right behind me. He just times it perfectly, knocks the books out of my hands, and my papers just fly everywhere. You ever been in that situation? We're like, the bottom just drops out in your gut, and you're like, uh, awesome. Like humiliation, embarrassment, brokenness, like all of them. And so right there in that crowded hallway, everybody's just walking, you know? And then you got like the cool kids who just, it's like their gift to make light of someone else's problems. And so they're like kicking my paper. And you have like the random you know, cool girl in the corner, like, that's like, oh, too bad for you. <laughs> and then you got, like, the valedictorian girl walking by, trapper keeper. Should have got a trapper keeper. <laughs> Velcro holds it in. Holds it in. I don't know if you can relate. You've been in that situation where you just desperately, desperately need help. You are just crying out for help. There's a story in the book of Luke. You've probably heard it. It's one of my favorite. It will be a little bit of a, a refresher for some of you, but I'll read it to you. The story says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Let me just stop right there. Expert in the law. A lot of times for the last 15, 20 years, I've had the incredible privilege to travel around, and I get to speak at like junior high and high school camps and all that kind of stuff. And I was up at a camp not too long ago called Spring Hill up north. Uh, and... Um, you know, Spring Hill, and this 13-year-old this boy comes up to me, and he's like, I don't understand. We're talking about this lawyer guy in the story. And I said, well, it's not so much like a lawyer. The expert in the law, right, this is somebody who knows the Old Testament. This is somebody who knows Scripture backwards and forwards. So this guy comes up to Jesus, and he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, like he does hundreds and hundreds of times throughout Scripture, it's actually kind of fascinating to go through and count how many times he does this. He asks a question in response to a question. Like, I love that. He has so many questions. One of the things we do in my house, I have four kids. My wife and I have been married 17, almost 17 years. We have four kids. My oldest will be 14. She's an eighth grade girl. She is just everything. She's sort of in this phase where you know, she lets on that I'm not the coolest person in the world anymore. Especially when I sing One Direction to her in Walmart. <laughs> I mean, story of my life. I, like, I just like, I let it go in aisle seven. And I'm like, come here, sweetheart. Come here. You're the story of my life. Crying. <laughs> let me just say her hashtags that day weren't all that awesome. Hashtag embarrassing dad. Hashtag what the heck dad. Hashtag hope my dad's not reading my hashtags. I mean, it's just like, this is what is going on. <laughs> Sorry. I absolutely love her to death. And then I have an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 6-year-old. And we're, all, we're always telling stories. We're always asking questions. Because we want to be a family that listens to each other. And one of the best ways to listen to somebody is ask questions. And so we sit around the dinner table and we ask questions. What's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? What do you think about that? What would you do in this situation? We're always asking questions. And that's what Jesus does so often. He asks questions. And he asks a question to a question. And he goes to the expert in the law. And he says, listen, what, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And the expert responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, 
your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So this guy's an expert in the law. He pulls together two different passages of Scripture. He pulls a passage of Scripture from Deuteronomy that says love God with everything. And then he pulls a passage of Scripture from Leviticus that says love your neighbor. And he puts them together. And he says, yes, love God with everything. Let me just pause right there because you've heard that a million times over. A lot of times what I do sometimes when I go in retreats and I speak to teenagers and I, I like, will tell them, love God with everything that you are. And sometimes teenagers will ask me, how do I love God with everything that I am? I'll say, how about this? Love him so much that you give him all the passwords to your life. Love him so much that you give him the passwords to your heart. We have passwords for everything nowadays, right? Our Facebook password, our email password, password for our iPhone, password for this, password for that. But I wonder if you and I have given Jesus all the passwords to our heart. Are there places that we just strategically leave the password off because we don't want Jesus to have access there? See, I think when we love God with everything that we are, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we give him passwords to all of us, to every bit of us, to every single ounce of our being. And this is what this guy says, love God with everything that you are and love others. And Jesus says, yes! You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But that wasn't good enough for the guy. So he wants to justify himself. So he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus, like he does so often, because Jesus is the greatest storyteller of all time. Jesus is the greatest teacher. He is the greatest mind to have ever thunk. Jesus is the greatest teacher ever. He tells a story. And he tells a fantastic story that even people who don't know God or acknowledge God or believe in God know this story. And I don't know how many people you hang out with who are far from God. For almost 20 years, I've been able to serve at churches. For some reason, when I was 19, a church in Redford, Michigan hired me as their youth pastor. And I don't know why they did, but they did. And ever since then, I've, been, I've served at churches. And then uh, up until a couple years ago, I served at churches. And then I started a nonprofit organization. And I traveled around the country. And I spoke in public schools. And so I did the exact opposite of what I was doing. I was uh, in a church forever. And I was always uh, teaching youth groups and youth group kids and speaking at retreats. And then all of a sudden, I'm traveling in the public schools. And I'm standing in front of um, thousands of kids in assemblies, elementary school kids and middle school kids and high school kids, and I'm, in, I'm imploring them. I'm encouraging them. I'm trying to challenge them to choose kindness over the, the other option available, which is bullying and exclusion. And it was absolutely fascinating for me because I grew up in a Christian home. I went to Christian school, K through 12. I went to Bible college. My family tortured me as a kid because we played Bible trivia at night at dinner time. Like, that was my, like, childhood. Let's play Bible trivia. Oh. Mm. Who was Rehoboam's donkey? I know, I know. Like, that was my childhood. But all of a sudden, all these years of my life started to add up. And I realized as I started going to all these schools, I had spent all this time of my life around mainly Christians. And now that's obviously right because 2 Corinthians says, hey, if you're going to partner up with somebody, you're going to yoke up with people, surround your inner core with people who are fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's your inner core. But obviously, outside of that, Jesus encourages us to be the light of the world. And so all of a sudden, a couple years ago, I find myself not working on a staff at a church for the first time in almost 18 years. And I find myself with no office, so I work at Panera Bread all the time. I don't like work there. But I like work there. So I'm like always there and the staff knows me and the GM knows me. And I live up in a town called Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Now Mount Pleasant is in the middle of the mitten. That's what we say up there. It's in the very middle of the state and it's a small town. We've got a little university there, Central Michigan University. We had the number one pick of the NFL draft last year, pretty awesome. But it's kind of a smaller town. I grew up in the city of Detroit. I was a youth pastor in the suburbs of Detroit. And then I moved to Chicago, and I was a youth pastor in Chicago, and then, then I moved up to Mount Pleasant, and it's small. Like, I have Amish neighbors. No joke. <laughs> like, Amish. Like, Hezekiah. Like, Amish. I'm not making fun of them at all. They're awesome. They're awesome. One day we're driving home, and, like, there's an Amish buggy, and they're, like, bugging it along. And the dude's, like, chewing on a piece of hay, and there's, like, seven cars behind him. And he doesn't care at all. He's just chewing on his hay. And we're driving by, and one of my sons says, he goes, I feel so sorry for them. They don't have phones. They don't have 
video games. And then my other son, which shocked me, he's like, I bet they feel sorry for us. Because as I like watched him, he was having a conversation with his son and there looked to be no rush in his eyes. And I thought about it for a second, how many thousands of times I look at my phone during conversations I'm having with people and I'm so rushed all the time. That's a sidebar. But Jesus, he begins by telling a story. He's telling a story because he knows that it relates to people. And so a couple years ago, let me back up into my story. I find myself like um, now I'm, tr I'm around people all the time. For the last 20, 30 years of my life, I had been surrounded by Christ followers all the time. Barely had any friends in my arsenal who were far from God. And then all of a sudden, I'm finding myself in Panera Bread all the time. And I'm meeting all these people. And one day, one of the cashiers comes to me. Her name is Sarah. And she sits down and she's like, are you that like pastor guy? See, I started a church four months ago up in Mount Pleasant. It's called Thrive Church. Most awesome thing I've ever been a part of in my life. And every single day, I just thank God that he chose a guy like me. And I, I have no idea why, because I'm like, there's so many more qualified people. But so I'm telling people about my church all the time. And we're up there. And she comes up to me, and she's like, are you a pastor guy? And I'm like, uh, I don't use that word. Uh, just, I'm Jason. I mean, some people confuse me for Matt Damon, but that's just like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of awkward. Matt, Matt. It's me. What up? How you doing? Getting ready for Ocean's 14. Yeah, you know, like, it's just, it's just what you do. And she goes, she goes, I don't understand something. She goes, you can't be one of those God people. And I said, what do you mean? She's like, those God people just hate everything. My heart just broke. When she was 15, she got pregnant. She was really part of a, a church, and her parents kicked her out of her house, and she felt like the church kind of alienated her and kicked her out. That's her story. She interpreted it the way, but she was just done with God and done with church, and she's been on her own for four years. And she's like, I don't understand because those God people hate everything. They just hate stuff. And she's like, you're so cool. I was like, oh, can you tell my 13-year-old daughter? Like, can you hashtag that right now? Like, get on my Twitter, please. Like, hashtag it. This dude is cool. I don't know how often you are around people who don't know Jesus. But so Jesus is talking to this crowd of people. And he tells a story, and he tells a story. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him half dead, went away leaving him half dead. This is like a 12-mile journey, Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a mountainous, rocky terrain. Absolutely perfect spot for somebody to be attacked and robbed. Perfect spot. They hit out. They did it. I finally joined civilization. I had back surgery um, three and a half weeks ago. And so I'm not, I know I'm, maybe it seems like I'm a little animated. I'm normally more animated. I haven't been moving very quick lately. And so I've been laying on my back a lot. And for some reason, I never watched the show 24 years ago until my back surgery. And I've started to watch 24. Holy cow. Where have I been? Like, everything now is like Jack Bauer. And I'm thinking of, like, this passage of Scripture, like, the terrorists are, like, hiding out. Like, they needed, this guy needed a Jack Bauer. Anyways, that's, that's not important, but I just thought I'd throw it in there. But they, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. They left him half dead. I mean, they just humiliated him. You ever had that humiliating situation? For me, it was in high school. I'm standing around in the hallway, and I'm trying to pick up the pieces of paper, and people are just walking right by me, left and right, left and right, left and right, left and right. They're walking right by me, laughing. Have you had those kind of situations where you just desperately need help? Well, here's a guy who desperately needs help. And then it says a priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, saw the man, he passed right by. Now let's give the priest a little break, right? There's all these Levitical rules. One of them was you can't touch a dead body. Maybe he thought the, the guy was already a corpse. If he was already ceremonially cleansed, he wouldn't have been able to touch him because he wouldn't be able to go back in the temple. All those Levitical rules. So maybe let's give him a little bit of break. But for Pete's sakes, he saw the guy and he kept going. Have you ever seen somebody in need and kept going? I have. Then it says, uh, a Levite. When he came into the place, he, he saw the guy and he passed by. 
Two options there. Jesus is probably talking to a mainly Jewish crowd. So at this point, it's probably Jewish, mainly Jewish men. And they're probably like hyped up thinking that Jesus is about to say, and a Jewish man is about to be the Savior. Jesus throws them for a total loop because he uses a word that is so disgusting to them. He says, a Samaritan. Do you know the hate that existed between Jews and Samaritans? Do you know the racism and the, the pain and the, the hurt and the bigotry and the hate that was between those two? Like, have you ever had somebody that, that just, I mean, just made everything in you? And this is what happens. Jesus says a Samaritan. So the crowd is probably getting all oh, angry at this point. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. See, the difference was when he saw him, he took pity. And that word pity means like a deep empathy. He took pity on him. It's like my 11-year-old son, every time the, the dog commercial comes on with the Sarah McLaughlin song, I will remember you. And you see the dog. And like my 11-year-old son's like, Dad, we got we to gotta do something with the dog. Yeah, look at that dog. We have so much food in our house. Let's go feed the dogs. I love his empathy. This guy, this guy, he has empathy. He has compassion. And when he saw the guy, he did something. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds. He put on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when in return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Jesus finishes the story with a question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? Easy answer. Expert in the law says the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Here's the simplicity of it. As Jesus followers, let's go and help. Let's go and be Jesus. Let's go and live Jesus. Let's make every ounce of our lives about Jesus. Let's give him every single password to our hearts. And let's be Jesus wherever we are. You're sitting in Panera Bread. Be Jesus. You're in a hallway. And someone desperately needs help. Be Jesus. Let me tell you uh, one final story. Um, I found myself in that situation about five years ago. I got a phone call in my office. I was working at a church in the Chicago area called Willow Creek Church. And I was on staff there uh, in the junior high department, and I worked with the small groups, and I absolutely loved it. And I loved being at Willow Creek because I love what Bill Hybels says, that the local church is the hope of the world. It's, the local church is the hope of the world because of the message of Jesus. And that's one of the reasons that why I've sacrificed so much of my life to plant a church because I believe we need more churches. And we need more people to step up and plant more churches because there are people who need to be reached for Jesus. And the local church is the hope. And we need more of those. We need people who will flood into churches and give their lives to love people through the churches. So I was in my office at this church, and I got a phone call from my brother, and he's like in hysteria. My brother's five years younger than me. He lived in our house with us. And I lived in a neighborhood right next to the church. And so there was like this little pathway, and I could get over to the, to the neighborhood. And I couldn't make out any word that he said, but I kind of heard the word fire. And I was like, oh, what is he talking about? Like, it's January 2009. I'm thinking, is it the neighborhood cats? Because, oh, I hate those cats. Cats are just, mm, ugh. Like, they're just awful. Ugh. Like, they, they start a fire in the neighborhood. Like, those cats are up to no good. I mean, my mind is just rolling, you know? It's just going. So I walk out of the the entrance of the church and over to my left I see a giant smoke cloud and I think oh God please let that not be my house let it please be the neighborhood cats <laughs> this cat's up to no good what does the cat say anyways <sighs> wrong <clears throat> get in my car I go around the neighborhood and I, I get into the neighborhood and there's 12 fire trucks outside my house and our house is totally engulfed in flames. And there's smoke and fire coming out of every window. And have you ever been in that situation where you just need help so bad? In the course of four hours, my wife and I lost every single possession we owned. Everything, gone. We watched as the firefighters heroically put out the fire. But in the midst of it, 
everything we owned was gone. Our kids were littler at that point. If my oldest is 13 now, five years ago, she must have been six or so. Eight, thank you. <laughs> Looking for help here, people. <laughs> math wasn't a strong suit. Still isn't. My fourth grader comes to me. Dad, help me with my math. Who do, who, who do you think your dad is? Like Julius Pepper? Like some smart guy? Like... I didn't mean to say Julius Pepper. I meant to say, like, Ron Swanson or somebody really smart, but I, I didn't. Some of you got that reference. Let me keep going because I got I to gotta finish up. I'm standing there in, in the street, and, and, you know, the firefighters are doing their thing, and I'm talking with the fire inspector, and it just so happened that I happened to be renting the house from the pastor of Willow Creek's uh, church's son. So I'm renting the house from Bill Heibel's son. So here's the crazy situation. Not only is the house that we're living in is on fire, not only do we lose every possession, but it's co-owned by Bill Hybels. Like, he's sort of a big deal. Like, people know him. Like, I had never talked to him up until that point. I did at that point because somebody had to tell him, like, yeah, your son's house on fire. Oh, oh. It was like in the newspaper the next day, Bill Hybels' home on fire. Oh, I'd walk around church for like the next three months. Are you that guy who burned down Bill Hybel's home? <laughs> no. It ended up being electrical and all that kind of stuff. But in one day, everything we owned was gone. My two youngest kids have a genetic disease. I don't have enough time to tell you about it, but it's called phenylcantinoria or PKU. They can't eat protein. Their bodies can't process it for, so for their entire lives. They can't eat meat, chicken, dairy, cheese, ice cream, chocolate, pasta, bread. No protein. So they have to weigh and measure everything. We do blood tests. They have special food. They're on medical formula. We have a dietitian. We have all this kind of stuff. We lost all of their stuff. Have you ever been in a situation where you just desperately needed help? Where you've been at the end of your rope. You've been broken. Just as before I got up here, I looked at my phone, and there's an email from a lady in our church who she can't pay her rent this month, and she's like, I cannot believe I'm asking you this, but I have nothing else to do. I'm going to be evicted. I have my two young kids. I don't know what to tell them. Have you ever been, like, at that level low? You ever been there? Well, if you have, here's the good news. As Jesus followers, we can do something about it because every single day we can go and do likewise. We can go and be Jesus to the world that desperately needs Jesus. So look for ways to help. Look for ways to go and be Jesus wherever you are. Does not matter if you're in class, you're walking to class, you're at McDonald's across the street. Does not matter where you are. Be Jesus. Help in such a way that people only go, that's got to be Jesus. Every day my mom used to drop me off to school and she would say these words, Jason, you may be the only Jesus that somebody sees today. Be Jesus wherever you go, whatever you do, and help provide for people. Some of us, we live such a high maintenance life. It's all about us all the time, our Facebook, our likes, all this kind of stuff. Change that all around and make it all about the people around you. Let me just, let me finish you this way. I... I am horrible asking for help, horrible. But when my house burned down, I didn't know what else to do but ask for help. And before I could blink, like my small group from church, the people I worked with, our neighborhood, were like assembling all these clothes for my kids. Every piece of furniture in my house was given to us by people. At one point, we had a stack of gift cards on our dining room table like that high because people were just giving it to us. Because I had done some traveling around the country, there were youth groups that sent my kids toys. There was this little boy that packed up his Nintendo DS. I was 14 years old. I'd met him on a retreat somewhere. He saw it on Facebook that our house burned down and that my son lost his DS, and he packed up his DS, and he sent it in the mail for my son. There was another uh, uh, woman that I had met on a retreat somewhere, and she got back to her church with all these other moms, and she made my kids new blankies and new towels and all that kind of stuff. They lost all that stuff. God provides. You can be used by God in someone's life. That's my challenge to you today. Let me pray for you. God, I just thank you for these people. I thank you for this amazing opportunity that we have uh, had to worship you, to look into your word. God, may you use us to go and be Jesus.
may you use us to represent your son. May you use us to model Jesus, to be Jesus, to love like Jesus loved. God, would you put people in our path? God, the days that were stubborn, the days that were prideful, the days that were bitter about life, God, strike it out so that we could be Jesus to the people around us. It's too short not to care for the people around us. God, may we be like the Samaritan who went over and above, who went over and above when he cared for the people around him. Help us to go and be Jesus. We thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen.